Welcome horror fans back to the week in horror. January 12th through January 18th. I'm JL, with me as always are Alex and Eugene. Hey, what's up guys? Hey, what's up everybody? So, last week we did the the best of the decade. The films that we loved over the past 10 years since we closed out, you know, 2019. We're now in a brand new fresh decade. And a whole score of horror films that are coming down the coming down the pike. And I was kind of curious as to what everybody's anticipated horror films were. Like, what you guys were looking forward to. Oh, uh, definitely looking forward to, was it the next Halloween movie from, from Blumhouse? I, that's That would be my go-to as well. That's, I think, Halloween and then, what is it, Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends? Yeah, and I think Halloween Ends will be out in 2021. Yeah, 2021. Yeah, I think those are probably my my top anticipated. Well, I go ahead. No, yeah, because right off the bat, that's that's the that's the one that initially comes to mind, especially if it maintains like that same level of even, all it has to do is just maintain the same level. It doesn't have to try to one up or do anything like that. If you just keep that same level, it both of them will be good. You know, it's going to be good. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I have. Faith. Well, I can say that um, there are two that I'm looking forward to. One is a little bit of a of a more indie horror film, and it looks fantastic from the trailers. It's called Antlers. Okay, see, I saw that. Yeah, yeah that that looked like it was going to be good, and uh, it just looks like a creepy. I, I I'm guessing it's a Wendigo uh, horror. Uh, that's oh yeah, what that's what I got off. Yeah, of that's it. what I'm mm-hmm. getting. Is a uh, but I think it, it it's going to look really really. It's gonna, I think that's going to be a freaky little film, and uh, the uh, the return of Candyman. Oh yeah, that's right. It's gonna be another Candyman okay, film. Okay, see, I just saw. Um, it was a western called Badland, and Tony Todd was in it, and like he comes in and plays this role that I've never seen him play before, and I was like, oh my god, I can't. Sorry, that just reminded me of it. <laughs> but he's he's a he's like one of the first African American senators of this town, and he's like sending this bounty hunter essentially. He's a detective to like round up all these people that committed like war crimes in uh the civil war and he plays as a senator he was actually really good i was like oh my god i wish oh, i could see more of him he's, just... he's a great actor still he's still killing it he has great screen presence like you just every time you see him on screen it just like hits you in the face he just belongs there <laughs> I really, I still love, but whenever I, whenever I get in the mood and I go and I binge watch um, X Files, is yeah. is the episode with the with the with the veterans that were experimented on where they took away their sleep. Um, and he was one of the he was one of the veterans. I think he was killing. Yeah, he was he was the bad guy in it, but he was killing people or something was going on. But he was surprisingly empathetic, and you know. In that one, like I was, it, it was a real vulnerability. It was impre- It was impressive for a horror icon, you know. Yeah. So just yeah. Love. I love seeing hearing him. When I heard he was coming back to the Candyman franchise, I was like, "Fuck yes, yeah, yes. this has got to happen." Now, the, another one that I'm really interested to uh, see that's coming up is the new Invisible Man. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. with Elizabeth Moss. Yeah, we go straight up horror instead of. You know the dark universe, what you whatever the Tom Cruise is trying to do. This straight up horror movie. It looks creepy. It looks scary. Like I mean, I'm really excited about it. That it, I wonder how that's going to hold up to. Uh, um, I guess that that psychological genre. That's going to be so cool to watch. This character develop. I'm so excited for that. And Elizabeth Moss is, of course, a great actress. I know. I just want want to see what she's gonna do. Yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited for it. I'm excited for it. it. Comes out in like a month and a half, something like that. Oh crap! Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I think a couple others that deserve note. Um, well, I don't think that uh, Kristen Stewart's new one, uh, Underwater. I don't think I don't know if that's gonna be any good. Underwater horror is so hit or miss. Because you know, you know, Leviathan was you know. Typically, they wind up being creature features, and Leviathan was okay, and you know, Deep Space, you know, Deep Star Six was okay. Um, the Abyss is really the best because that wasn't even a horror film. But so, and then uh, I think um, Underwater. I'm not sure. I'm fifty fifty on that one. But uh, there's also the uh, uh, movie called The Turning, 
starring Finn from uh you know Finn Wolf I think Finn Wolfgard from uh from it you know it and Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's in it, and that's kind of like a retelling of Turning of the Screw. Okay. Um, Run, sweetheart, run! Looks like it could be pretty interesting. And uh, that and uh, the boy about the uh, the doll. Mm-hmm. That had Lauren Cohen in it. Uh, uh, that one is getting a sequel as well. So there's some interesting stuff coming down the pike. Yeah, I feel like we're actually starting to get a kind of you know a lot of sequels coming out because they actually just dropped the trailer for it's like a Quiet Place Part Two. Oh yeah, Quiet Place Part Two. Yeah. So they got to drop a trailer for that, and they also announced uh, you know we got a new Saw movie coming out and a new Purge movie also coming out. Oh no shit! I didn't hear. I thought the purge was pretty much just doing uh, the series. Uh, they just, no, I think they're done with that, aren't they? Uh, they're coming out. Uh, it's the title is unofficial, but the release date is July tenth, twenty twenty. So the purge five. Interesting. Okay. Wonder what they're gonna do with that. I don't know. I hope it doesn't turn into like another saw thing where it just goes on and drones on and on. On and yeah, because I I like the. The four that were made told the story of the purge and how it came about and how it concluded fairly well, you know, because I think uh, the fourth one in it was, or was it the third one? It was a, was it a trilogy? Or was there four? I want to say there's there's four. I think there was purge one, then there was the second one, and then, well, maybe there was just three. Okay. Yeah, because one of them was like. Like a Fourth of July. Yeah, there's there's now. four there's four uh, because you had the one we had the senator who was against it, and then you had the one that talked about the first purge. Yeah, and the, the one with the senator against it was um, where basically the the founding fathers are trying to have her killed because if she survives purge, like, she's going to be able to overturn it and shut it down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, then, yeah, they could definitely... I didn't see that one. That yeah. must have been the newest one, then, huh? Yeah, that, that I thought that was the... Uh, that was the third I thought, one. I, you know, I thought the story was, pre- was pretty well contained in the you know in what they produced. I didn't I didn't know they were going to be able to continue on with it, so that, that should be interesting. I don't know whether... We'll, we'll see how you know, it goes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious as to where they're going to go with that. So it's a lot of possibilities, because it's just a, it's such an <laughs> open an open concept, just purged United States somewhere, so we can see what they do with it. Interesting. All right. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned the Invisible Man. Yeah. Um, uh, Lee Wannell is directing that. Ah, okay. Yeah. the The guy behind the guy behind Saw and Insidious and all that stuff. All right. Well, looks like we got a lot of stuff coming down the road. We're uh, in twenty twenty. We're looking forward to it. So uh, let's kick this bad boy off. So. One thing that some of our listeners might not know a lot about is that January to February and August to September, these four months of uh, the year, typically what are known as dump seasons in Hollywood terms. Now, a dump season, for those that don't know, are periods of the year when critical and commercial films, or what, what they call tentpole films, typically don't perform very well. And so studios tend to avoid releasing these kinds of films, you know, major films during these months. And they often save, you know, bottom of the barrel films to, you know, to keep filling up theaters and keep people coming in. Because, you know, bottom of the barrel movies, they can be they can be hit or miss. They usually throw them out there and make a little money off of them. Or sometimes you get a sleeper hit and one really, really scores. Um, uh, but as we hear at Week in Horror know that uh, the best of the bottom of the barrel is often horror movies. And this being January, in a brand new in a brand new year, we have a ton of terrific films to choose from that all released in the dump season. So and I think some of these are really really awesome. So let's kick this bad boy off. I think Alex, you've got the first one. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Start this out. Yeah, <laughs> January thirteenth, back in nineteen eighty nine, with a, I guess you could call it a slasher demon movie called Pumpkinhead, which I thought was fantastic. This movie's fucking amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was great. I like how you started out and it's, you're watching it and you're like, what the fuck is going on when they're sitting in the room and and uh, that dude goes running through the cornfield, runs into the scarecrow. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And he's like, let me in. He's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what is going on? So this movie... Uh, 
This movie is about a demon that is summoned because a fa- or a, a boy ends up getting killed by this group of well, it was by this one dude on his dirt bike. Show off, little asshole! Fucking hits the kid and then takes off, and everybody's like, "Go back and help!" And he's like, "No, I'm I'm a badass, and the cops are gonna catch me." And then the boy dies, and the father gets really pissed off and summons a demon to one by one take out these assholes. And can I just point out? I think one of my favorite scenes in that is when he's choking that one girl <laughs> and drops her <laughs> off the fucking rock. He's like, oh, "Oh, this is for real." <laughs> So yeah, this I I don't know. I love this movie. I don't know what you guys think about this movie, but I loved this movie. I thought it was really the fucking thing was written and directed by Stan Winston. Yeah, Stan Winston did this one. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the the dad, uh, Lance Henrik. Lance Henriksen. Yeah, Henriksen. Yeah. yeah. Fucking yeah, legend. he was great in that. Like right at the he walks out. So what's wrong with dad tonight? Nothing. <laughs> He's like, yeah, no, he's a badass in this movie. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Jeff East and Kimberly Ross was in this one. Joel Hoffman. Pretty, I mean, some pretty low-level names that a couple of them you hear him. Like Lance Henriksen was, I think, the biggest one in that movie. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was. Apart from some character actors, yeah. Yeah, you you have... Uh, yeah, I don't think anybody really came out of that uh, one. Oh, you have Mayhem. <laughs> but, dude, pump... How you pronounce her name? Mayhem, uh... Uh, Mayhem Blyak from, um, oh, oh, uh, Malin Bialik. Yeah, Malin Bialik. Yeah, she was in it. Yeah, that one. Yeah, who was on, uh, Big Bang Theory. <laughs> but you gotta expect something pretty phenomenal from the, like, the, the special effects, uh, master that is Stan Winston for him to write and direct a movie. I Dude, mean, he killed it with the pumpkin head costume. The creature's gotta be something, is something fucking amazing. It was so great. Oh yeah, because it actually so it took a team of people uh, to actually put it together, and they are because I do want to give a shout out to them. So you have Alec Gills, Shane Mahan, you have John uh, Rosengrant, and then Tom uh, Tom Woodruff Jr. Tom Woodruff Jr. So Tom Woodruff Jr. was the one who actually played inside the actual costume while the rest of them went and did like puppetry and stuff like that. And the fact that they were able to create something, which kind of I noticed a little bit of an alien influence of it, you know, a little bit from the movie alien influence of kind yeah, of just a little bit slimy, <laughs> a little bit here and there, yeah. but they only had a budget for, of $3 million for the entire film. So, like, they had to really, like, okay, we have to really streamline. And the fact that they are able to put it together and make it work, and they pretty much use, like, the same puppet, like, throughout the film. So, kudos to them. Man, these are what you, uh, Tom Woodruff Jr., he won an Academy Award for Best Special Effects, I think, for Death Becomes Her. Uh, yes. Uh, so, did he get the award for that? Yeah, he, I think he won it for Death Becomes Her, and he was nominated for it for Alien Three. Yeah, he was he was nominated for Alien Three, so you can kind of see a little bit of the influence right off the bat. So already tied in with the Alien franchise, you know, he's already Academy Award winning. So like, yeah, yeah, they, I mean, they definitely went the right route to go. Uh, he also was he also did work like in Tremors and Starship Troopers. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> nice. One of Kevin Bacon's finest films. Love Tremors. Love Tremors. <laughs> so freaking funny. Well, one thing I, I I love is you know Lance Henriksen, you know the the top billed actor in this, and obviously the most the best well you know the most well known of anything. I think um I think this one came out a little bit before aliens before he really had his breakout as bishop uh this one came out no i think uh aliens came out right before then think right before it yeah because aliens came out in 86 that's right that's right that's right aliens came out in 86 and then that's right then he was on on dangerous ground in 80 that's right okay yeah so and then uh pumpkin head you know uh 89 89 release so yeah, so obviously coming off of that, but Lance Henriksen, I wanted to spotlight on this guy. Uh, we love character actors here at Weekend Horror, as as our audience knows, and you know, while while a character actor, yeah, you know, Lance Henriksen is a legend in the business, especially in in horror. Still, he's still working to this day. Um, 
I think he's like 79 now. Uh, I think he was born in 1940. Yeah, yeah, that would make him 79. Yeah, and he's still cranking out work. Um, what was it? I think. Uh, yeah, he had a film. Uh, I think uh, he he had stuff coming out. And yeah, you know, he had Detroit Detroit Become Human before they did Hearthstone, Aliens, Colonial Marines. He worked on that one. Um, he's doing a lot of voice work these days, which is interesting. Uh, he's kind of transitioned to that. Obviously, he's he's getting up there in age, so he's just working um, voice work a lot, and he's doing work uh, for Disney as well. But he's been uh, he recently showed up. He was in Legend uh, Legends of Tomorrow. Um, still, you know, episode of Criminals, Criminal Minds, Grey's Anatomy. So the guy is still working it out, like big time. Um, his distinctive voice and distinctive look, pretty much, he's recognizable no matter where you go. And he does both A list, you know, big budget film, and still does, still has time to churn out a few B listers or you know a few uh B schlock horrors. So, but I remember seeing him. I think it was yeah, the first time I recognized him. I think it was in Aliens. Seeing him as Bishop, and of course, you know, like everyone's gonna remember the knife scene. Are you talking about the scene where uh, he was crawling to the tube? Oh, there, there's that scene as well. Oh, the kind of claustrophobia oh, of that. oh, but I'm talking I know about the, the, the knife scene with with Bill Paxton. Yeah, we has his hand on the table. And yes. so you hear him, <laughs> he's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that was that's that you know that was the big thing that kind of brought him to prominence. He's kind of say you know that this guy's a cut above. And then, um, what was it? Uh, he had, then he was uh, in Millennial. He or he was the lead character. He was the lead actor in Chris Carter's Millennial or Millennium, which was the uh, kind of like uh, in the vein of the X Files. Mm-hmm. The two kind of ran, ran, you know, with Chris Carter. Chris Carter created uh, Millennium, and he was. Uh, I think that was some of his finest work, and that he brings an uh, just how to describe it as an actor. He brings a sense of uh, every man, but a sense of ease to the character. It's very, very natural for him, no matter what he's playing, whether it's an android or a demon or, you know, or just a regular guy or whatever like this, something like that. I mean, I've always been fascinated by his work. I love, I love the dude to death. I'm glad he's still working. Yeah, he was in the actually in the Nicolas Cage movie. It was like Mom and Dad. That's right. Yeah, he played, he played the great. He played the granddad in Mom and Dad. That's Holy right. Holy shit! I forgot about that movie. Yeah. So I mean he's still he's still getting work. He's still getting work right now. Um and then doing just a little bit research, I completely forgot that he was the king in Super Mario Brothers. The video game movie. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Which we talk about that in the last <laughs> podcast. But yeah. And I know that um I know that uh Cameron, James Cameron's got a big like you know, he James Cameron has his kind of st- he has his stable of actors. I know Bill Paxton was in that stable. Lance Hendrickson was also in that stable because uh, Hendrickson was in Piranha 2, uh, which is pretty much where Cameron got his start, where it was kind of his breakout as far as film goes, because honestly, Piranha 2 was pretty fucking good. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'll you, agree. You, would, you wouldn't expect, you expect to say that, but Piranha was okay. Piranha 2 was a James Cameron film, and it was fucking action-packed and actually really good. Like and surprisingly good, was fucking fantastic. Okay, because it, it's like, wow, the first movie is about piranhas and they're loose and they're eating people and this is crazy and they're like, okay, okay, just don't go in the water. Well, James Cameron took the idea and was kind of like, let's make them fucking fly. <laughs> <laughs> How can I James Cameron the shit piranhas. out of it? <laughs> this is gonna be fucking sweet, and it was, it was sweet. I know he. Uh, so Hendrickson showed up in that one, and then you know, off the bat, then he was in Terminator. Yeah, he uh, was, and. And then on Aliens, mm-hmm. so and he just kept. You know, I mean, he was in there. Um, Alien Three, uh, obviously reprising Bishop, and oh, another another. Uh, I liked him in Man's Best Friend. Oh yeah, who did he play in Man's Best Friend? He was the the scientist who was was trying to recapture the dog. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, he's he's all around. Oh, I mean, that's super cool that he's still doing voice acting stuff too. Now that he's getting up there, he's like, "Yeah, no, I'll keep yeah, working." I'm only seventy nine. Oh, fuck. Do, do you uh, do you remember him in um, the Quick and the Dead? Are you talking about the no. uh, Sharon, Sharon Stone, Stone Gene movie? Hackman, from like ninety five, something like that? Yeah, I haven't thought about that movie in a long time. Yeah, he was in that. He was uh, the dude with the aces on his. Um, 
uh, on the I was not on his boots, but uh, he was the car the the uh, the trick shooter. Oh, it's been way too long since I've seen that yeah, movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't even know if I could make no mistake. That movie had a, that movie had a big fucking cast in it. Yeah, I remember it not being like a bad movie, like at all. I just haven't seen it since '95. <laughs> it was absolutely. I'm gonna have to go back and watch it. Yeah, it wasn't super terrible. It was just Sharon Stone. They, they, there were better actresses than Sharon Stone. Yeah, <laughs> just period. <laughs> oh yeah, I love. I, 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 yeah, I, I agree with Alex. I'm glad that he's still working. Um, I'm actually so I was actually surprised because in his voice work, he because uh, I'm a big um, I'm a big Hearthstone player, uh, which is you know a digital card game from Blizzard, and apparently he did voice mar- voice work in that and. Now I'm gonna to have to jump back into the game and see if I recognize his voice because just I keep playing until you hear his voice. I I know these cards that he that he they, because whenever you play a card, there's a they, you know the there's the character like says something they have like a line, and apparently he he did voice in that. And he also did voices in Aliens Colonial Marines, um, where he was pretty much reprising Bishop. That was a I, that was actually I did uh I did some mocap work for that video game. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Back in the day. Yeah, that was the that was the one and only time I've ever done motion uh, motion capture, so I got to work on that one. That was pretty cool. Did you get to wear the cool suit with the ping pong balls? I did get to wear the cool suit with the ping pong balls. I did. It nice. was uh, me and two other people, um, and we played. Uh, it was kind of like the opening intro cinematic. Um, I, they they had me run on a treadmill. They had me sitting at a table. They had us playing cards. And it was interesting because they put one of the little balls on the card, and we throw the you know to to track the cards moving. And, uh, <laughs> then they had me uh, go you know cl- climbing up a ladder and then sliding down a ladder like fireman style. So oh, that sounds fun. To, yeah, they had us doing that. Um, they, so it was, it was it was pretty neat. It was so funny because I'm in this mocap suit. I look like a fucking idiot, and they got me running on this treadmill that looked like it was built in like 1975. <laughs> but it still worked. The fucking thing still worked. And I'm sitting here just like running and they're getting the mocap off. And that was really fucking cool. So, but yeah, I'm so glad that he's, uh, that he's still churning out. I hope we, I hope we see more from him. I know he's getting up there in age, but, uh, here's to him. Yeah. Hopefully he has, you yeah, know, at sure. least another 20, 30 movies left, you know, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right on. Just, just, start, just start turning him out like Nicholas. <laughs> a normal <man>. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take whatever comes across the desk. But he was great in this movie. And this movie is definitely a must-see. It Especially, like, since movies are dying down this month, if you're looking for something to watch, je- check this one out. It's good stuff. Uh, that being said, though, with this slasher demon who is raised in just absolute rage... I would like to see him go up against some other horror icons. So if we threw him into a bloodbath, audience, who do you think he should go up against? Who should we pit Pumpkinhead up against? Who the fuck would Pumpkinhead be up against? That that is a damn good question. That is a good question. I see. I'll talk about a movie later that might even be <laughs> solid. <laughs> I'm just you know that you. You know that Pumpkinhead will show up in the bloodbath eventually. Oh, he has to. Yeah. He's brutal as hell. <laughs> and remember... For, yeah, that's a, that's a good question for the audience. And remember, for our listeners, if you want to check out our bloodbath, subscribe to our Patreon. You'll be able to hear it. Plug. Plug. Ah, uh, shameless plugging. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta pay the bills. Yes. <laughs> Keep the mics on. <laughs> Join our Patreon for a dollar a day. You can keep your podcaster fed. <laughs> Less than- for just one dollar. We need Sarah, Sarah McLaughlin. <laughs> you, Are you out there? For just one dollar, you can feed a podcaster today. <laughs> Less than a cu- cost of a cup of coffee. <sighs> uh, uh, truth hurts. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Coming up for our next film, right, we have a classic, classic movie, right, that actually came out January 14th, 1981, and that movie... Ooh, I was one. Oh, we weren't born yet. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't be born until nine years after this movie came out. (laughs) (laughs) Fucking Christ. (laughs) <laughs> well, this time we made it, what, like, actually, like, 20 or 30 minutes into the podcast? 
<laughs> yeah, this is okay. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> and so the movie, the movie we're talking about, of course, is Scanners, directed by David Cronenberg, starring Jennifer O'Neill, Stefan Lack, Patrick Gohan, and Michael Ironside, who I love, Michael Ironside, my, my man, Michael <laughs> yes. Ironside. Love that dude. Yes, Rico, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what to do. It's not a... Everyone fights, no one Wait. quits. If you don't do your job, I'll shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Ironside. Yep. Oh, I fucking love Michael Ironside. God, he's so he's fucking sweet. He is. He is just everything he does. Um, but for those of you who don't know, the movie Scanners, right? It's a it's kind of a, a science fiction horror film, and it's actually about these people who have psychic abilities, right? And they can do things like telepathy, and they can make things explode, and read people's thoughts, and all this other kind of stuff. And the government, it was a private military, actually started doing experiments and wanted to collect these scanners, what they call them, scanners. And so it's actually about two people who are scanners on the run trying to fight against the big corporation Consec, who wants to control and actually created a drug to um to drug to basically help pregnant women and then the kids become scanners kind of thing when they're born and nice I breeding have... scanners <laughs> 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 that whole fucking movie <laughs> I mean, come on, it gave us one of the best gifts of all time. Um, sure but uh, the, I think Scanners was like the ultimate epitome of, I think this is where Cronenberg peaked in his body horror. Well, I mean, it's either this, I think uh, this is really where he started diving into it. I, I, I would actually go, I'm going to retract. I'm going to say he peaked in The Fly when he remade the fly. I can I can go okay, with that. Yeah, fair. I can say that. Yeah, but this one was where he really got his where he real I would say he really got his dick wet on this one because his fascination with uh the horror the the horror of ourselves and not understanding the body and the weird things that can happen to the body um has always been so creepy uh cuz he's gone through phases as it stands, and early in his work, he really, really focused on the you know, the terror of what's going on inside of you, or uh, what could be going on in your mind, the things that you don't know, the things that are going on that you don't see in other people, you know, like the person walking down the street, you know, something, you know, whatever's going on. But um, I think uh, Rabid, one of his earliest films, you know, the one with the girl with the tentacle that grows out of her. And she starts like draining people to feed off of them, and then turns them into zombies. And they start you know wreaking havoc and shit. But she's just trying to keep it under control. She's a beautiful woman with this horrible thing that came out of her. That was part of an experiment to try and save her life after an accident. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of like the doctors like implanted this parasite in her to keep her alive, and turned her into a monster. I'm just trying to help. <laughs> yeah, right. And then. Um, and then so he was like he kind of like that that's when he when he stepped into it. And it was, well Shivers as well. I think Shivers but Shivers not so much. That's when he was you know kind of going in and then but of course Scanners and then really uh, jumped into it with Videodrome which came after this. Cuz Videodrome is a total mind fuck. Not just because it has James Woods in it who I think it you know is able to do a mind fuck no matter what cuz he's James Woods. Mm-hmm. Um but Videodrome was a really freaky fucking film. And that's when he, I think Cronenberg started mastering it. And then came The Fly in 1986 with Jeff Goldblum, which I think is probably his crowning achievement. Yeah, because what's terrifying, what's terrifying about body horror, horror is it's what's going on inside of you and there's nothing you can do about it. Whereas like a slasher or something like that. Okay. Well, if I'm being chased by a killer, we'll just run and stay away from the killer. But when it's actually like coming from inside of you and there's, you feel completely helpless. Like there's so much going on. You can't control it. There's nothing you can do about it. And you just basically watch yourself like deteriorate where there's a tentacle yes. becoming part fly kind of thing and there's nothing you can do about it that's what's scary about those and it's movies like this that kind of paved the way for you know other for other horror films like um uh contracted 
or uh, Thanatomorphos, uh, which are both two really grisly body horrors. Um, but we could think, uh, do what? Thermatomorph, thermatomorph. I can't Th- say. Thanatomorphos. Thanatomorphos. Yeah, that one. Yes, that, I don't know if you guys have seen that one. That's a that's a real visceral body horror, like really fucked up. <laughs> or uh, or like another one called Bite, um, about a girl who gets bitten by an insect and starts mutating into a monster and shit like that. That one's really fucking graphic. That one's pretty, and, and it's pretty disgusting. That one's a pretty gross one. Uh, fucking hate it when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I mean, that's one. Of the, that's one of the tropes of like body horror is it has to be visceral, it has to be graphic, and kind of thing. You know, it has to be something beyond like, oh, well, somebody's turning into a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to see their insides on the outsides, <laughs> which is pretty much you know the fly, Jeff Goldblum and the fly. So yeah, exactly. I think yeah. That I uh, that scene when Gina Dav- Davis rips his fucking his face just comes right off. That was so fucking horrific. It's like <laughs> oh. rips his jaw. Oh, yeah, oh, that's not good. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she's just like, why? <laughs> she just fucking flips out. But yeah, the 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 transformation of Jeff Goldblum, um, the crazy fucking visuals of Videodrome. Um, he had one uh, he had one movie he directed called Crash, which was about people addicted. Sexually addicted to car accidents. Oh, huh. which it, it had James Spader in it. Um, that one was that one was a fucking mind trip because he started with kind of external body horror. So you had <laughs> with external body horror, you had like um, the brood, you had uh, Shivers, Rabid, the Brood, Scanners, Videodrome, and then the Fly. But at the time, you, then he but before the Fly, he directed the Dead Zone with Christopher Walken. And then he started getting kind of into the inter that was the external body horror. Then then he got into the kind of internal body horror, you know, like with Dead Ringers and Naked Lunch and Crash and and then he kind of combined the two and so you know, with Existence with Jude Law and Jennifer Jason Lee. So he's always had a way of twisting the kind of visual perspective and always pushing in new directions. Very, I would say, uh, the David Lynch of horror. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so Definitely. but but with going back to scanners, we cannot forget that that head. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So so talking about that loud noise making your head water explode. <laughs> I like this that poor segue. man, dude. You, you okay? Okay. For those who have seen, you got to give it. You got to give it some context. Okay, so there's a scene in this movie which it's one of I I would say one of the most iconic, especially being so early in the the body horror stuff. It, I guess different. You've got these you know scenes like you said in like the fly where it's like okay yeah the skin slothing away and the <laughs> jaw gets ripped off. In this movie, it goes into this scene where one of the scanners is sitting next to this guy, <laughs> and he starts using his telepathic powers. Which, this reminds me of the movie Rubber, but um, <laughs> uh, he's sitting next to this dude and he's using his, his powers. And the scene lasts for like, I think it's like probably 15 or 20 seconds where this this the fat middle-aged balding man in glasses is just having an existential crisis and nobody can really tell what's going on. And he's freaking out and you hear this loud squealing and you see this look on the dude sitting next to him's face and you're like, oh no. And then his motherfucking head just explodes. And the way that they do this scene is just straight on. It's like slowed down a little bit. But this dude, I don't I don't even know how Eugene would be more into the aspect of the special effects on this. But the way that his head exploded and the way that like there was no cut, it was just straight on. It was just fucking brutal. It, like you can see his face get all <laughs> fucked up and like the back of his head wraps around the front of his head and it just and then everybody's like holy fuck i think uh, to for context in the scene um there's a there's kind of like an auditor who's hired by the evil company the evil corporation yeah and he's a scanner and he's trying to use his abilities to uh to kind of read people and michael and the person he's trying to read is michael ironside and but he doesn't know the auditor doesn't know that Michael Ironside is also a scanner. He's also a scanner. Okay, so when he starts trying to scan the scanner and, my, and Michael Ironside starts fighting back, it causes like a feedback loop that goes <laughs> the to poor that, dude that, that, next to him is just that pushes back into the guy's head. 
<laughs> and he comes apart like a fucking watermelon. <laughs> so, so this is how they actually did it, right? So, you know, uh, Cronenberg wanted, obviously wanted to be visceral and wanted to be brutal. And so they were trying it was. different types of like explosions and blasts, like watermelons and all this other kind of stuff. And it just, it wasn't working. It wasn't gratuitous enough. It just, it didn't look right. <laughs> he wanted the extra blood and guts and stuff, right? And so... So what they did is actually fucking blew the dude's yeah, head. Yeah, so they actually, like, they basically told people, like, okay, listen, everybody, uh, go sit in your car. And so, like, every, most of the crew people went and sat in their car, drove off, had lunch, just whatever. They cleared out, like, the set. And so it was, like, clothes... Only necessary people need to be there. And then it was either the production designer or uh, art director of one of the two basically set the head up, went behind it with a 12-gauge shotgun, and then actually <laughs> shot the head. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible how accurate that scene is. <laughs> If you've ever had the displeasure of seeing that happen, it was so close. It was just disgusting. I don't know. I don't know if anybody. I, I don't know how many people have seen a slow motion video, um, or time lapse video of a water balloon popping. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what and it's like. Now imagine that video, but replace it with a head full of blood, stringy bits, and hamburger meat. Yep. And it, it 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 has created one of the most memorable gifts I think that has ever run the internet, of just the I think bloosh. what gets me the most <laughs> is like when it happens, his face is like the last thing to like explode. So it's like it's so insane. Just go on YouTube and look it up. I'm sure you can find it. Scanner's head explosion. Yes, you will find it. Oh my god! You know, it, fucking, that's just fucking Michael Ironside's there with his the fucking veins in his head going wall wall wall. We he got this like stare down going on, and then fucking he's like uh, 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 he's sweating like a pig. Just, ah, fuck, We're having a stroke, and then I I like how nobody else like. Everybody, you could kind of see everybody's getting a little uncomfortable. If I saw that dude and that sort of like pain or egg, I'd be like, uh, hello, this, this man is having a fucking heart attack. Like, help he him. medical attention now. Something's wrong. But no, they all just sit there and then his head explodes and then they're like, oh my God. <laughs> then everybody runs away. Oh, oh yeah. Such a sweet scene. Oh god, that's so intense. Oh yeah, it's de definitely, definitely something, and it shocked people um, for that time. <laughs> yeah, well, that blew people's minds. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even intend for that. <laughs> it blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, it did. All over the fucking stage. <laughs> so. We have a question for the audience. What is your favorite Cronenberg movie? You know, we talked about Scanners. We talked about a couple of others. So Scanners, Videodrome, The Fly. We talked about Shivers and Rabid. Or maybe a couple of others. Crash, uh, Eastern Promises, or just uh, any of the ones from his filmography. What is your favorite Cronenberg film? I gotta tell you, I'm partial to... I, I, li I love The Fly, but I'm, I, have a, I have a special place in my heart for History of Violence. Oh god, I forgot about yeah, that one too. Yeah, he did that one. V Vigo and Maria Bello were off the fucking hook in that in that movie. That movie was amazing. That was. Yeah, I'm gonna go back and rewatch that. Yeah. So good. I, I, I fucking love that one. That that was a fantastic little film. So yeah, but we're picking up next. Ooh, I got a good one. Um, and it's a surprising one at that. So this one came out January sixteenth, two thousand nine. This was obviously intended as a dump film, but it is My Bloody Valentine 3D. Ooh. So the remake of the 1980s classic uh, slasher film, My Bloody Valentine, uh, and obviously released in January, no intention of this film doing anything solid, obviously, you know, because this is like middle of the month. And uh, I think the claim to it was 
Jensen Ackles from Supernatural was involved in this one. It actually had a decent a decent little cast. This is um uh directed by Patrick Lussier and starred Jensen Ackles, Supernatural fame. Jamie King, uh you remember her as uh the sexy prostitute from Sin City. Uh Kerr Smith and Kevin Teague. And I think um yeah, it was it was uh Todd Todd Farmer was behind the screenplay on this one, if I remember correctly. But uh, either way, for I mean, it's literally a remake of the original one. Um, guy in a minor suit starts killing people on Valentine's Day. A uh, little bit of a twist at the end. Don't want to give it away if you haven't seen it, especially the 3D version. But shot on a budget of fourteen million dollars, so not a big, not not a giant investment for a major studio. Um, considering this was Lionsgate that put this bad boy out. Yeah. So not a giant investment for a studio, but this fucker turned in one hundred million for its box office. So yeah, yes. that's a success right there. <laughs> that makes a success. Think- yeah. So this is one of those moments when you've got a dump film that can churn out that can churn out a profit. And maybe they anticipated it, maybe they you know, maybe they expected it, but the marketing on this bad boy wasn't that huge. And this is just kind of one of the things that you, you sometimes you throw out a dump movie and it just fucking lands. And well, I attribute it to all the all the fangirls and fanboys of Supernatural who went out and pushed these numbers up because ooh, Jensen's in a movie. He doesn't do movies that often. He's always on TV, so they, you know they're obviously going to go out. Just like um, House of Wax, which was a an abysmal film, <laughs> but still performed well because Jared Padalecki was in it. Yeah, and you got to watch uh, Paris Hilton get fucking impaled. So that that was actually the best part of that fucking movie. That really was. Oh, I was so happy yeah, when that, that happened. Good. And the same thing with Mike with the Michael Bay produced remake of Friday the Thirteenth. Um, Jared Padalecki was in that one, and that also pushed those numbers up because Supernatural fans are going to go and see that stuff. But by any right, the film is not bad. The film isn't bad. It actually holds kind of a, a kind of a on a, a, a record because it was the first R rated film. That was projected in the real D technology at the time, and so that hadn't it's been so used, yeah that hadn't been used in uh, for anything R rated or anything with a with a wide release like that because the technology was expensive at the time, and so this one went out and proved that it could be done. You could use it in horror, and you could make a shit ton of fucking money off of something like this, even on a sequel that, in my personal opinion, or not even a sequel, a remake that wasn't even really necessary. No, no, it was not something that you would have even thought about pulling out of the archives. But like when this movie came out, she so said you don't think it's really necessary. And I, for whatever, this was genius because Lionsgate saw something that nobody else did. When I, this movie was 2009, so I was like 19 when the, I, I'll always remember this movie because for some reason everybody was talking about it. And I don't know what they knew in the studio or, or what was going on. But the, I mean, if they were going to pick a time to do it, that was the perfect time. Cause everybody that I knew was like super involved with this movie. They were all talking about it. The 3d just came out. I I'm like, it blows me away that they shot their shot and they fucking scored so hard on this one. Because like you said, it was like brand new, uh, real D and it came out even like, it was like a month before Valentine's day was even, uh, upon us and so no i don't think it was a necessary remake but it was a i don't know it was one of those diamond in the rough i don't even know what to call it it was just I think, luck i guess I think it, it, it's one of those cash grabs you know it's like we it can had really, to have been, we can but be they a... fucking they got it <sighs> they did they knocked it out of the fucking park it actually and it's I mean, not even it's, it's a it's a for for slasher formulas it's pretty straightforward Right, and if you've seen the if you've seen the original one, like okay, it was open, closed, shut, done. That's cool. Like leave it behind. There was no reason to like bring this particular movie back up into the spotlight. It wasn't you know, the original was pretty good, but it wasn't like a, it wasn't Scream. You know, it wasn't like okay, let's redo this huge box office hit. And it's the thing is like I think a lot of it has to do with timing because the timing with movies has such a big impact. You know what? What other movies are out in theaters at the time? Um, that's why you'll get some movies like Fight Club that Fight Club bombed in theaters, or like Donnie Darko bombed in theaters, but then they become huge cult classics because a lot of times the timing was off. And I think with this one, not necessarily really 
like springboarding off the original, like, you know, Halloween or some of these other ones, because like I saw this one first and had to go back and rewatch the original. I think they just hit it. You know, maybe it's just at that time, there wasn't really much out in theaters. It could have been the only horror movie out in theaters at the time. And you start getting the new technology that was like, you know, super impressive things coming at the screen. And it just kind of timing wise, I think just all the pieces came together and you get a successful film. Yeah, I will say it, it was pretty creative in the ways that they came up, you know, you could smoke somebody with a pickaxe, which I have to admit is a pretty nasty way to go. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah geez, that was brutal. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, you say, you talk about, like, the flying axes and stuff. I think this was probably so successful because of the 3D technology, and everybody wanted to see what they could do with it, and they wanted to be, like, you know, jump scared. So this was... I, like I said, for whatever reason, my age group at that time, like everybody that I knew went and saw this movie. You could talk to anybody about it and they had seen it. And it was just, it, I think it has a lot to do with that. Like you said, time, it was perfect timing. Nobody had done a scary movie on 3D yet. You know, uh, Jensen Eccles was in it. And yeah, I, I, I went and saw it because I wanted to see an ass get thrown at me in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's the thing about 3D technology. So 3D technology, they've been trying 3D for, you know, as long as there's been film. And it kind of has this up and down where, like, you had, like, one of the biggest ups was, like, Jaws 3D um, in the 80s where you had to have the blue and red glasses and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Those, like, cheap things that, you know. But you you go and you watch it and it throws colors off and it's, it's just... You know, people like, oh, it's kind of a novelty thing. And then, of course, that kind of died out. And you really didn't get a lot of 3D stuff like in the 90s and especially in the early 2000s. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now we got some digital stuff. We got some more CG stuff. Let's try it again. And this... Here comes James Cameron. <laughs> Who wants to create an entire <laughs> world. <laughs> Go fuck everybody else. <laughs> 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 but i think it, i love that guy yeah, I, do. I love james cameron but i think because a lot of comedies will kind of like oh here's throw some stuff and it's kind of like whatever but i think with a horror having a pickaxe thrown at you having somebody's eyeball shoot out at you or blood Dude, you know, yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right audience for it it is it's, it's it, it definitely kicked off a whole slew of pretty awesome 3d movies well, so that beg that that begs the question, and I think a good question for the audience. So, um, which do you prefer? Do you prefer the original nineteen eighty one My Bloody Valentine? You know, sans the the three D effects, real good practical gore and horror. People, you know, the minor smoking people with the pickaxe. Or did you really, really dig the Jensen Ackles vehicle, My Bloody Valentine three D, the remake with uh, the real D technology that sent the pickaxe straight through the screen, straight at your head? Um, which one did you prefer? Let us know. Yeah. All right. Well, move on to the last movie of the dump week. <laughs> January 17th, 1986. You made it sound so sad. <laughs> we we got to so go through these sad. films. <laughs> I have a lot of really mixed feelings about this movie, but when we're talking about Pumpkinhead, I think this character from the movie Troll, the troll from the movie Troll, would probably be a good contender. Wow, okay, Torok the Troll versus Pumpkinhead? Yeah. I think throw them both in the woods and see what happens. Oh, I'll, I'll have to weigh that. I will uh, I will have to weigh that. That would be a good one. Because I was thinking Torok the Troll versus Leprechaun. That's so obvious, though. Well, yeah, with the little people. <laughs> you the little people alone, have the... Jesus Christ. They don't have a reach advantage. <laughs> Fuck politically correct. They little people... They're little people. Uh, they both got yeah. magic. You know, let them go. <laughs> yes, that's fair. <laughs> Stop it. Now I want to go watch Midget Wrestling. <laughs> I've seen Midget Wrestling, and it is as fun as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it too in Wisconsin. <laughs> it was great. But anyways, <laughs> leave the little people alone. This movie starring Noah Hathaway. Uh, Jenny Beck was freaking fantastic in this one. Um, Shelly Hack and Michael Mora Moriarty. <laughs> Moriarty. Oh, no. Yeah, I can't do that. My, my mouth doesn't work that way. <laughs> Moriarty. There we go. Michael Moriarty, man, he was in the stuff. Yeah, he was. No, he's great. And I, <laughs> one of my favorite scenes is when uh, when uh, 
uh, uh, Harry Jr. is pounding on the door and he's like, let me in. And the dad's like dancing in the the living room right before Jenny Beck, or I guess Wendy fucking knocks him out. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm just like reliving this movie because I'm so mixed on the whole thing. I don't know how to feel about any of it. Uh, John, John Buchler. Buchler. <laughs> Hey, we're supposed to be professionals. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay? Sorry. 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 John Bugler. 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 Fuck. I can't words today. Leave me alone. Bugler. 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 John Bugler, Bugler. Bugler. Directed this one. And uh, so, so the premise is... Fuck you. Bugler. 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 God. Anyways. The, uh, the troll is essentially taking over in a apartment building i guess i really don't know he he goes in and he snatches gotcha bitch and then <laughs> takes over <laughs> wendy's form and goes from the apartment to apartment and just fucks people up and then he goes into uncle don's apartment and what is it uncle was it uncle don is that what he called himself uh sonny bono's character yeah i think i just remember i remember he was a player yeah yeah, he's like Uncle cuz she goes in there and she's like I've got a question whatever. He's like Uncle Don's got the answer whatever he says. <laughs> but the, but then she's like what are you talking? Oh, I've seen I've stared death, death in the face and she's like what does it look like? He's like well it's it's complicated. She's like well I know what it looks like and he's like uh what? It's like it looks like this. <laughs> and it just goes into a hardcore metal film there cuz it's great. <laughs> i don't know i see okay i thought the movie was good i thought it was a good concept it was really hard to look that troll in the face and be serious <laughs> <laughs> well it, you know it ties into you know that whole little that little period where you get the fantasy like the fantasy films you know like you know like legend and labyrinth and uh i know we talked about like warlock uh on the last podcast but that night like 1986 you get the troll who has like a magical ring and he goes around and like starts spreading plants and stuff like that and it's like what is he doing like, oh, okay he's okay Tor what is Torok, the point? okay Torok the troll has a ring okay and yes. the ring and he's and he the the basically he stabs people with the the ring has like a little magical deal but anyway he stabs it's got a people little probe on it. Yeah, he stabs people with the magical ring and he turns them into denizens of the fairy world. So he transforms them into like a, the things matching their characteristics. So like nymphs and elves and and goblins and stuff like that. So he starts transforming the residents of the apartment complex of this apartment building into denizens of the fairy world and transforming their apartments into like the the places in the fairy world where these residents would reside other dimensions yeah so and his objective is to basically take over the entire apartment complex uh take over every you know every single apartment to basically open the open the doorway between his world and our world and kind of allow the fairy world to spill into the real world. Is that he's basically trying to he's trying to build a and... he's, he's trying to build a foothold in our world in order to open up the door and bring in his world and take kind of take over our take over the earthly realm or whatever like that. And he does so by going around and uh you know turning other you know turning all the residents into hideous fucking monsters and shit and there's a uh, one resident of the apartment complex who like knows him knows what he's doing and is you know there to basically try and stop him yeah there's the the witch and then uh harry jr yeah but every single but every single apartment was you know transformed into its own kind of ecosystem you know its own kind of world within that apartment god that movie was just way way ahead of its time it it, it, it really was unlike its you know quote unquote sequel which is the sequel sucked, dude. I couldn't even get through the first I was like, hoping, half of I was that. hoping we weren't going to mention that. <laughs> I had to bring God, it up at least no. once. No, because Troll is pretty good. And then Trolls... They're Trolls. Yeah, Trolls is pretty good. Um, That was an animated film. <laughs> <laughs> Troll 2 sucked. 
<laughs> They're gonna eat me. <laughs> They're eating her. They're gonna eat me too. <laughs> and let me tell you, the popcorn scene. I I I I, 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 I don't know. I, I I don't know. They're like making out with a corn of cob, and then popcorn start popping everywhere. I don't fucking. I just, I've never fucking understood know. it. Um, I think that's like a. It's like one of those films that's supposed to fucking hypnotize you or whatever. Because it's just I don't. I can't feel about this movie. About the about the original troll. What no troll two? Oh troll two. I mean oh god. I guess any of them. Well okay. Well troll was a fantasy film and yeah. with right. some with some serious horror elements in it. Oh yeah. So and I think just. What, what what struck me is not only I thought the uh, some of the effects work were really really good. I thought I thought the troll uh, the 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 Torok troll character was decently done. Facial animatronics of the costume were were pretty were pretty decent. And of course you know it's a little person who's in there you know playing them like that. But then a lot of the set work creating the different uh, kind of like atmospheres or or ecosystems of each apartment you know, like that. There was a lot of work that went into those. I thought the puppetry was shit, <laughs> you know, to say the least, and was very what? obvious puppets. No. Very obviously, they were they were it was it was very sad puppetry, but uh, a lot you could tell a lot of love, a lot of work went into it. Uh, there was a lot of dedication into making that movie work, and I think given by the cast that was in, I mean, you had Noah Hathaway who was uh, it was fresh off of um, Never Ending Story. He was a Treyu. In the first Never yes. Story, you had Michael Moriarty, who was already an established actor. Um, so, fucking Sonny Bono. Moriarty. And um, Jennifer uh, Jennifer Jason. Oh, no, no sorry. Um, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. This was, I think, was her first film. Was it her first one? I think, I'm think i pretty sure that this was her first movie. I guess, yeah, she would have been pretty yeah. young. Well, she started a movie with Sonny Bono, so yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. <laughs> but I will... Fucking Sonny Bono. Love but otherwise, a, 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 I would say a nice little entry um, to revisit on occasion. Just be oh, – as because an example is kind of like what, what Eugene was talking about, the kind of fantasy-centric 80s where either – where it was horror or sci-fi or adventure or comedy, things had a – things had that kind of uh, fantasy twist like, you know, like Golden Child. Mm-hmm. Okay, or God, yeah, um, we're revisiting a, a lot of good ones tonight. Yeah, like Golden Child or uh, Big Trouble in Little China. It was a great movie. Yeah. Oh my god! So just you know the, the fantasy oh, elements like that that were that were utilized, and then of course one thing that I thought was really really weird, and let me get your guys' opinion on this. So I'm gonna run this down really fast. So this movie came out January of '86, and this same year, this summer in the summer. Labyrinth came out from Jim Henson Productions. Now, Labyrinth, obviously a classic. Jennifer Connelly, David Bowie, um, fantastic fucking movie. You know, yeah, a staple of my childhood. Um, but Labyrinth cost twenty five million dollars to make, and only grossed fourteen at the box office. Ooh, so a an absolute commercial failure. Okay, and it and it was critically mixed. All right, Troll. Only cost about a million bucks to make. Only. And gross. I got that later. Yeah, and grossed over five. That's a success. So Troll was, yeah, Troll was actually a critical, a critical slam dunk, because it more than doubled its money. Yeah, that that's okay. a win. So that is a win. So, and I find it weird because there's there's two things that go into this. One, uh, Labyrinth was almost so. So that's those two movies. So that that reflects the kind of of fantasy style, fantasy centric films that were coming out in the eighties. Then on top of that, you have, I don't know if uh, our listeners, some of our older listeners might remember the, the author, Maury Sendak did um, children's books, children's picture books. He did the, where the wild things are. And he had another book uh, that the story was, the story was of a little girl who goes to Che, who goes to find her sibling who was captured, who was kidnapped by goblins. And, Maury Sendak's people kind of went after Jim Henson because they felt that Labyrinth was too close to his story. That's why there's a special thanks to Maury Sendak in the credits of Labyrinth. But Troll, which came out in January from a smaller production company that not a lot of people knew, that, that you know, wasn't big, not like Jim Henson was. Troll is about a brother 
who has to go in, whose uh, sis, younger sister is kidnapped by a, by a troll, by a uh, troll king, and taken to a fairyland, and he has to go rescue her and stop his evil plan. Huh. Hmm. Similar. Okay. So, all three are similar. And Maury Sendak's book came out a little bit, I think came out in 85, either 84 or 85. So, both these uh, movies played on, but both these movies played on that, but only Jim Henson's got, got kind of tagged for it, I think just because of the size of Jim Henson. You know, they, you know, Sesame Street, The Muppets, and then, you know, uh, Dark Crystal, there's a lot of money that's behind that. And then, you know, dark you, if you're going to go after anybody, you don't about. go after the creator of Torak the Troll, you go after the creator of Kermit the Frog. Kermit the Frog here. Okay, so there's that, which I find to be interesting, but there's also, and you mentioned it earlier, Alex, that the lead character, Michael Moriarty's character's name in this movie is Harry Potter. Harry Potter. That name sounds he's familiar Harry a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> his name is Harry Potter. Harry, He's Harry Potter Sr., and his son is Harry Potter Jr., Holy crap, so Harry Potter, uh, uh, fairies, wizards, ah! Ah, Same universe. (laughs) Now, I I see a love triangle. One of the producers in the interview said that he did not believe it when J.K. Rowling said that she just came up with Harry Potter off the top of her head. Like, it it just came to me. And he was like... I'm sure it did, it's because you've heard it before. And this dude was like, yeah, right. (laughs) Yeah, okay. But, you know, Harry Potter is such a common name and all, so, you know, sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. So I find that to be very, very interesting. Um, that's that's super interesting. And kind of what I wanted to talk, what I want to get the audience's take on that. This is a this is a very, very broad, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying that it's there are unconnected, I think that there are unacknowledged connections between these things. Between Mari Sendak's picture book, between Troll between labyrinth and all leading all the way up to the Harry Potter friend to the Harry Potter novels by JK by by JK Rowling. You know, I think yeah, each one kind of that's... fed off of the other one and I think is an excellent example of of kind of how Hollywood works on occasion. Yeah, if anybody's got any information on that connection there, feel free to send it to us. Yeah, or give us your opinion. Yeah, give us your opinions on that. Tell us what you think. I I I found that to be weird in my research. I thought it was like this is really really interesting. Well, actually, I caught it the first time when I was rewatching Troll. I was like, "What the fucker's name is Harry Potter? What the shit?" Wait a second. <laughs> it all makes sense now. It all comes together. J.K. Rowling's like sitting in a chair in the corner, just like excellent. excellent. <laughs> yes, Harry Potter. Yes, I'm going to use that. Oh God, J.K. Rowling. Her people are going to hear this. She's going to come knocking on my door. We must silence you. <laughs> you excuse me. Button. I heard you were talking some shit. Oh no. <laughs> also next week just one of us has disappeared just gone <laughs> <laughs> i don't know he's gone and i just found this letter on his desk it says hogwarts <laughs> <laughs> off to hogwarts i feel like that's the bottom of the pacific ocean so <laughs> <laughs> wake up there's a fucking owl's head in my bed <laughs> nine and three quarter hundred feet under the sea <laughs> all right well we have um we have a couple of birthdays this week. Yes, we do. So the first birthday we have, uh, born January 12th, 1965. And he actually started off by doing, directing his own music videos for, you know, songs such as Living Dead Girl and Super Beast and Dracula. And we can only do so much for copyright <laughs> reasons, but you know the song. <laughs> And he started went on to start becoming a prolific horror director, and that is Rob Zombie. That's Rob, motherfucking white, motherfucking yes. zombie. The man who who sh- who married Sherry Moon. Mm. God, I mean, hey, Sherry he, Moon. He knew yeah. what he wanted, and he fucking took it. <laughs> hey, uh, she knew what she wanted, and she fucking yeah, took it. That's probably, that's probably the better, better way to put that. And Rob was like, oh, okay, oh, right. pretty late. <laughs> yes. All you had to do is create a multi-platinum band and a prolific film career, so that's all you gotta do. <laughs> I mean, just throw on a lot of leather and ripped jeans and a fucked up cowboy hat, and you're gonna get some Yeah, ass. you can have your you very know, own. It was, 
It was uh, I loved Hell. I loved Hellbilly <laughs> Deluxe. I really did. I fucking love that album. Um, that was it. Probably shaped my childhood. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there was a, he did a really cool interview with Joe Rogan, where he pretty much walked through his career and everything and how his intention. I think the one of the coolest things that I heard Rob Zombie say was that his intention was never to become a rock star. Is that initially he always wanted to be a filmmaker, and he was um. He was inspired by the likes of uh, Roger uh, Roger Corman and Romero, and you could see those influences in his work. And so he was he he loved seeing those the, the kind of like midnight matinees and shit like that. And his time in New York when he was coming up were really really influential, just kind of like the seedy nature of where he lived. And so he wanted to be a filmmaker, and to pass the time, he was also in a band, and. Because he wasn't so big into the band, and he really had kind of had other dreams, and the fact that none of them really knew how to play, so they just were like making noise. So he was like, "This band's you know whatever, you know what, what the fuck ever, who cares?" So when they were offered a record deal, he turned it down from the first people that came along. He was like, "Wow, no, nah, no, nah, we're not, we're not interested." And the rest of the band was like, "What the fuck, dude?" He was like, "Ah, don't, don't worry about it." So they were offered a second record deal, record deal from someone else. And he turned that one down. And then he turned around, and he was like, no, no, I think we can hold up for better. You know, I really want to sign with Geffen. That's who I want to sign with. And the, the bandmates are like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? And then, sure enough, number three, Geffen came along and signed him. And that's how that's how White Zombie, be, you know, that's how that they hit the mainstream. And that's the music that, some of the mainstream music that we grew up with, listening to White Zombie. Yeah, Astro Creep. Yes, Hellbilly Deluxe, <laughs> um, fucking uh, uh, Super Beast, uh, Super Be- um, oh, I'll be Dracula. Oh yeah. So, and because the thing is, like, you can tell because he like the song was a more human than human. That's not a hard song to play. Like any like beginner guitar player can honestly play yeah. that song. But it's also proof that you don't have to be overly complex to write a good like song. Exactly. It helps. Don't get me wrong. Lyrics it does matter. help. But all you got to do, white, white zombie and Rob Zombie obviously have the ick factor that that this is the thing it just hits and it speaks to people and people enjoy it. And then obviously he uses the springboard into his film career. You know, starting with you know Halloween and Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, and he also did the fake trailer in the Grindhouse, the Werewolf Women of the SS. Werewolf, uh, were, werewolf women of the SS, yeah. that's right. <laughs> kind of thing. And so, you know, obviously, you know, his most recent thing being Three from Hell. But, I mean, he's somebody who, he you can tell he's embraced the entire horror, like, subculture. Like, he's somebody, like, I picture, like, if you ever got a chance to go to his house, it's probably like a giant, like, hearse in the front yard and spider webs and old medical instruments and, like, creature heads and all those other, like, fun memorabilia from horror films. And he's just somebody who just, like, embraces that. I think he was on an episode of MTV Cribs. Oh, where, he was. Um, yeah, he had people, he had people, he had the MTV Cribs crew come through his house. And, yeah, I think one of the coolest things I ever saw I'm t- was he... It kind of inspired mine. He has what's called the vault, and in his vault is his basically is his DVD collection. Oh, nice. yeah! And you're trying to imagine the DVD collection of um, Rob Zombie, and he, I think he he was saying that he started out originally that he was he collected old he oh he collected class he used to collect classic one sheets from like old films like really old films but he wanted like the original one sheets okay and then he got got, kind of got in trouble because he was spending too much money on it and so he was like yeah i can't keep doing that so he started so he started started going and collecting dvds and he's got this massive vault in his house that is his dvd collection that i believe last i checked he was still currently updating to blu-ray so he's currently he's currently working on that. The interview with, that he did with the, the with Joe Rogan on Joe Rogan's podcast was absolutely amazing. It was so eye opening, you know, hearing about his early years and like that. But then Alex mentioned when he was directing his own music videos, and that's how he kind of segued. That's how he got to kind of tap his director desire, his filmmaker desire, and you know support everything with the band. And that was, of course, the music video for Living Dead Girl, how he met Sherry Moon. Yeah. 
That's amazing. Saw her and just wanted to keep her. <laughs> yeah. It, that one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that ass in every movie I make. <laughs> this is my new lead actress and or wife. <laughs> and I got I got to say, uh, while her performances are kind of, they're kind of hit or miss. Um, if she tries to go multidimensional, it's... It's it, it's I, mostly miss. It's mostly miss. But I will give her She's props. I will at. give Sherry Moon. I gave her props earlier in one of our earlier episodes of of Week in Horror. I will give her props for Three from Hell because I think Sherry has spent so much time in the role of Baby Firefly, and that because you know she helped develop the character with her husband. She's intimately familiar with that character. It's nothing new for her. That she's been in it so long that she was able to add extra dimensions to the character for three from hell because in my personal opinion that 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 performance as baby was one of her best because she got the opportunity because you know you think baby firefly oh she's just a crazy you know prostitute girl who stabs people to death and laughs and it's hysterical to her that's it but she actually added some she added some some dimension to baby in the third film, which I thought was really impressive. And that can only come from, you know, working hand in hand with her husband for so many years. And I think goes to uh, the testament to the kind of communication they have between the two of them. Yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, they've probably sat down and chatted and talked about the script, you know, on their own, like private time and really working through to create that. Yeah. I think it's just testament uh, to the, the, to the filmmaker he can be and the filmmaker he wants to be. Because he's brought out some pretty, I mean, he's got a style, House of a Thousand, Devil's Rejects, he loves the blood, he loves the gore, and I think he likes to touch on how, I love how he, he in his direction, how he, his subject matter, how it affects the world around him. He's really, really focused on how violence affects the world. And kind of like the effect on society that violence has. Whereas, even though it's necessary at times, it has a distinctly a distinctly negative effect on everything around it. Whether it's good violence or bad violence, it doesn't matter. And I think he, he's got a real focus on that and how that just kind of is always permeating society. So, he's I wouldn't say he's visionary yet, but he's close. He has he has a unique take on it, and he he kind of messes with the audience a little bit, uh, you know, with the scene from a House of Thousand Corpses where you know they have the gun on the sheriff, and it seemed like it took forever. Oh God, the, the tension without breaking, yeah, just that draw out. One easily one of my favorite cuts in, in yeah, I've know I've mentioned it before in Halloween where you have it's a shot outside the house and Daniel Harris walks out all of a sudden Michael grabs her and pulls her back in and closes the door and it's like ninety nine percent of the time it's over. It just shows the door and holds it, holds it, holds it, and you're like, oh, I guess she's dead. That's boom! All of a sudden she kicks him, starts running again. Right? Oh, okay, I guess she's still alive, <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. So he he is able to get a, kind of a, a twist on it. He's able to kind of play with the audience a little bit, which I think you have to to be a good horror director. Oh yeah, he he definitely has some really superb moments that kind of shine where he where he gets he gets really really strong ideas. And I just hope, you know, eventually one day he'll be able to take one of those really strong ideas and really turn it into something special. I think he was the closest he ever got in Devil's Rejects. I, I agree. Which, yeah, which I think was arguably his absolute best work. Mm-hmm. So It's definitely his legacy. Yeah. All right, so happy birthday, Rob Zombie. Happy birthday, happy Rob. Happy birthday, Rob. So we got one more birthday, and this one I've been so looking forward to because he is one of my idols as far as – one of my inspirations as far as being a film director. Um, born January 16th, 1948. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, director John Carpenter was born. A legend. Yes. And this guy, uh, say ever since um, – I have to say, when I first saw The Thing, um, I think it was, I think I saw that back in 86 or 87. And I think that film was influential on me. And I would say was one of the beginning inklings of my career as a director. Um, Just at an early age, kind of set me on the movie path. Is that movies could do this to you. Movies could be this visceral. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I I think you just yeah. Oh no, oh no, go ahead. Oh, I was saying it's it, it was that was kind of that was kind of the kick. Well, I think was was near the kickoff line for me, and he's been an inspiration ever since. I, I was I was going to say the thing also because I actually I didn't see Halloween until like I was like pretty much an adult, you know. But I remember I caught the thing on TV. Um, probably was like 10 or 11 or something like that. And like that stuck with me from like the get go. And I remember I started watching it. I couldn't look away. And then like mom sat down and she was like, oh yeah, this is like one of the best horror movies. Keep watching it. And it like pulled me in. <laughs> keep wa- This is disgusting. Yo, keep watching it, honey. You'll like it. <laughs> like, am I in a horror movie? Mom, are you okay? <laughs> And so, I mean, the the legacy with the thing, you know, I honestly believe Halloween was the one that truly jump started the slasher genre. You have Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out a couple of years beforehand, and it was obviously a great movie. But to me, Halloween was the one that put it mainstream slasher movie. Oh yeah, absolutely. Solidified it. That was as, a real person in clothes with a knife. Yep, solidified it as a subgenre. You know, with and he, he, the work that he and um, his partner Deborah Hill did, just I think solidified the car the, the Carpenter style. Um, his Apocalypse trilogy is I always come back to that. Well, I know I know he's legendary for Halloween, but I always come back to the Apocalypse trilogy, which was The Thing, Prince of Darkness, and In the Mouth of Madness. Mm-hmm. All three of them fantastic films. Um, and basically different aspects of the end of the world in his, you know, in his eyes. Because each, each one of them, the, the world is potentially ending. And stellar cast across the board. I think it's, 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 I think it's his, his seminal work. Um, couple that with you know, Big Trouble in Little China. Um, uh, Assault on Precinct 13. Mm-hmm. Uh, Escape from New York. Uh, his, his, his take on Christine, which is also one of my favorites. Because I thought I just loved the way he handled that fucking movie. Um, I I haven't I haven't seen one of his that um, I would say vampires was a little lackluster. Yeah, I I think the weak one if I had to pick one would be the Ghost of Mars with okay yeah, with yeah. Ice, tea. ice cube oh, yeah, and ice Natasha cube. Henstridge yeah. Uh. But I'm yeah that was that was some terrible acting yeah that was the the <laughs> model at the very end where the train blew up kind of thing. Was, uh. Uh, but you know he's he's also he's one of those filmmakers, and we've talked about others like Sam Raimi, who basically they make the most of what they got because you take like Halloween. Halloween was not a big studio. Oh, we're gonna throw fifteen twenty million dollars at you. This was something was like three hundred thousand dollars or something like that, and it's like we're gonna create something with just what we were able to work with. And he's just he's been able to do that time and time again, and he's somebody who will influence horror directors for generations upon generations upon generations, and it has definitely case in point. definitely left his legacy. Yeah, case in point. Yeah. Oh, how can I forget they live? Oh you know, yeah. Like, oh like God, that, yeah. Keith David, Rowdy, and uh, I was Rowdy, Roddy Piper, but Rowdy Roddy Piper. Um, Rowdy Rowdy Piper. <laughs> honestly, one of the best fight scenes I've ever seen in a filmed in a movie. I've seen, I mean, obviously, I've seen a lot of fucking movies, but the fight scene between Roddy Piper and Keith David in the alley when he's trying, Roddy's trying to get him to wear the fucking sunglasses, <laughs> <laughs> trying to put the fucking glasses on, and it, he won't fucking do it. So they start, they just start brawling in this fucking alleyway. <laughs> it was one of the some of the best shit I've ever seen. When he picks up that board and he smashes it and he and he swings at him to take it, you know, try and take his head off, and he misses and he busts the window on his car, <laughs> and he fucking drops the thing. He's like, "Oh my god, I'm so sorry, man!" And Keith David like freaks out. <laughs> so, oh, brilliant stuff. Um, God, I, you know, I I don't think there's uh in anything I've done in my short films. And the things I've written, I think I've always come back and touched on a little bit of something from Carpenter. Yeah. Good. It's that is a good, good sign. Trope to pull from. You know, and also it's interesting, we would bring him up at the same time as Zombie because Carpenter himself is a composer. Because he composed he composed the score for Halloween. Yeah, he's he's on a couple of big movies too. 
Yeah, he's done. He's done quite. A, he's actually done more uh, film scores than he has uh, directing credits. I think um, for uh, for people familiar with his work, or if people want to check out check out his uh, his um, his composer work, because I think he's got three albums out. Uh, I think um, Lost Themes uh, and Lost Themes 2 and then Movie Themes from 74 to 98, which are kind of like, you know, him you know, flexing his composer muscles and the work that he could do. Um, I, he also did a lot, a lot of cool uh, collaboration, collaborative work with Ennio Morricone um, on The Thing and I think on uh, a couple of other films. But just, you know, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, just a well-rounded talent. Definitely very gifted. So for sure, yep, yeah. and uh, I really hope to see more out of him. I don't know. Uh, I know he's getting up there. Um, I know he's. I think uh, he's seventy one this year. I think he's turning seventy one or turning seventy two this year. I, 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 you know, he'd be seventy two. He's seventy turning seventy two this year. Yeah. So uh, he might be slowing down a little bit, but uh, you know, I hope he. I hope. I hope he can turn it out. Um, at least something else. To, to bring something else because I I think the last thing what was it the what was the last thing he did um you're talking about director wise I, I gotta look yeah I think was the ward yeah the war 2010 uh, that silly one with 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 Amber Heard mm-hmm. yeah okay and it, it wasn't it wasn't terrible I thought it broke down in the third act I thought it was kind of silly but I I thought that the the premise was decent I just think that I don't want Hollywood to start looking at Carpenter like he is like he's one of the old guard that we're just going to throw him a bone every once in a while to see him work. Um I hope he does I hope he gets he gets more respect for what he's uh, what he's brought to you know the genre and brought to Hollywood. So I just don't want to see him peter out just you know doing the occasional blah whore. I want to see him you know have at least one more knockout. Well, I think with with the, you know the beauty of horror is because it doesn't it can be separate itself from Hollywood well, regardless of whatever Hollywood thinks there will always be the upcoming horror filmmakers who first of all will be inspired by him and want to see him start doing stuff so even if like Warner Brothers or Disney or Sony or whatever it's like oh we don't care so I would love to see him do something with maybe Blumhouse oh that would be super cool that could be really cool kind of thing um, you know, so some something like that, maybe. You know, John Carpenter, if you're listening, you know, maybe one more, one more film. <laughs> Come on, do math. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a big trouble, little China too. <laughs> yes, you can't go. You cannot go wrong with Kurt Russell. <laughs> little China or little trouble in Big China. <laughs> Escape from New Very York cool, too. So. Yeah. So yes, the legendary John Carpenter. Happy birthday, sir! Happy birthday, John! Happy birthday! Keep him coming. All right. Well, that closes out another week in horror. Thanks, guys, so much for listening. Without your support, we wouldn't be here. Um, check us out. Uh, leave any feedback, comments, questions, concerns. You can do it on your comments on your podcast, which you can listen to anywhere: Apple, Google. Uh, check out our anchor.com page, anchor.com slash week in horror. Um, go check out our Patreon. If you want to donate a little bit, we'll give you a pretty good amount of extra content. Uh, patreon.com slash week in horror. We'll give you our week in horror bloodbath where we pit two horror icons together and let them fight to the death. Um, and we also have our week in horror after dark where we spend a little bit of time with special guests and get to know them a little bit better and more about their work. Uh, also facebook.com slash week in horror. You can go there, uh, follow us for your daily splatter. It's a little bit of horror history every single day. Um, and again, thank you guys so much for everything you guys bring to the table, your comments, interacting with us on Facebook, uh, if you have any questions or anything personal you want to send directly to us, you can also get us uh, at our Gmail at weekendhorror at gmail.com. Uh, you know, and you get, let us know. And follow us at Twitter at weekend. Oh, and Twitter. We've got Twitter, we've got Twitter now. now. Weekend Horror. God, we're, look at we're social media. I know. <laughs> Getting up there. Professional. But I, but I refuse to do Instagram. I am not an influencer. 
If somebody <laughs> no has to take to pictures. You wouldn't want to see pictures of us, anyways. <laughs> no one wants to be influenced by my shit. <laughs> <laughs> influenced to run away. No, I'm just <laughs> uh, no but uh, yeah, go check us out. Drop us a line. Shoot a comment out, question, anything you want to hear, we're listening. Awesome. Well, I'm JL. I'm Alex. I'm Eugene, and thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. See you next week. That's my line. Sorry. (laughs)